Siamo sulla montagna Etna. We're here in Mount Etna, close to the second largest Sicilian city, Catania. Palermo is the largest, that's northwest of here. And this is one of the largest caldera or uh, craters in the volcanic area around Mount Etna. Etna is one of what we could describe as the mountain roots of Greco-Roman civilization and European culture in general, since you have in the Middle Ages chronicles that relate far-off peoples in Europe to the characters that are identified with Etna. Uh, Snorri Sturluson, for example, when he talks about Odin and Thor, he describes them as descendants of Aeneas or the Trojan men of the company of Aeneas, the founder of Rome. And uh, Aeneas is one of the mythical or pseudo-mythical figures that are most clearly connected with this place here. So we're going to tell the story of Etna in three moments, three heroic personalities. Aeneas is the first. And in fact, Aeneas connects the whole constellation of foundational root mountains of the Eastern Mediterranean together. His story begins with the burning of Troy that Homer tells us about in the Iliad. The Trojans take refuge in Mount Ida in western Anatolia, modern Turkey, and they cut down the trees around there to make themselves a fleet. Now that mountain, even in the days of Caesar Augustus, was still connected to the female maternal deity, Sibyl, in the case of the Roman cult as Augustus presented it. But anyway, the Trojans sailed. First they went to Thrace. They discovered the Thracians had betrayed them. They went down to Crete, believing themselves to possibly be of Cretan origin. Crete is the site of another Mount Ida. This is the one where Zeus is said to have been refuged by Rhea, his mother, when he was a babe. It's a place of initiation. Neoplatonists like Proclus tells us it's the center of Hellenic ritual. But when they arrive, the Trojans are told that in fact their origin is in Italy. Their patriarch was an Italian. And so they continue on their way. At some point, because of storms, they end up in Carthage, modern Tunisia. But eventually they make it to Italy. They enter in through the area around Naples, Campania in southern Italy. Aeneas enters through a cavernous volcanic opening in that Pazuoli, the Cumae region, guided by an Apollonian sibyl, and he encounters his deceased father, Anchises, who guides him into a vision of the future Rome. So after that, he presses forward, having seen the celestial image of the city that he is to found, and he marries the princess of the Latins, Lavinia, and the Trojans become Latins at the behest of Hera, the wife of Zeus, and so Rome is born, not without complications. Aeneas has to fight against Turnus and certain other locals who aren't happy. Turnus wants the hand of Lavinia for himself, and it's in that battle that Sicily becomes relevant, because although Aeneas has not stopped by Etna himself, his mother, Venus, Aphrodite, has asked her husband, Vulcan, the blacksmith god, the forge god, to make a weapon for her son. And it's that weapon that he will use in establishing himself in Italy. It's the Cyclopses, the forge spirits, forge genies, workmen of Vulcan that make a sword for Aeneas here in Etna. Etna is like their forge. We're told by Virgil in the Aeneid that they forge the lightnings of Zeus here as well. After Aeneas, we have Empedocles. Aeneas's struggle would have taken place towards the end of the Bronze Age. Historically speaking, the actual city of Troy would be part of the ethno-cultural matrix of the Luyans, who were an Indo-European speaking people in Western Anatolia, neighbors to the Hittites. And the collapse of the Bronze Age during the 12th century BC would be the end of the city that the legend of Troy is based on. So Empedocles would come later. Although for his part, Dante in El Convivio Dante Alighieri talks about Aeneas entering Italy at the time that King David was being born. 
and there are certain later sources that want to present Empedocles as a contemporary of King David and of his uh, son, King Solomon, trying to connect biblical narrative with classical. But in any case, Empedocles would come after Aeneas, and he was one of the major pre-Socratic philosophers. There are accounts of his heavenly ascent, as well as his infernal descent connected to this place here. It's said that he threw himself into Etna while it was erupting, and he left behind him a single bronze sandal. Now that's been used to abuse the figure of Empedocles, to claim that he was trying to disappear and leave no trace, to pretend as though he had ascended, but that sandal gave him away. In fact, we have the Paris Papyrus, Greco-Egyptian text, written centuries after Empedocles, but it gives us a clue as to what's going on here because it refers to the bronze sandal as a sign of following the goddess Hecate. And we know that this place here is connected to the goddess of the underworld, to Persephone. There are Greek stories that Persephone entered into the underworld to marry Hades here at Etna. In fact, we have accounts according to which during the wedding, Zeus gave Persephone the entire island of Sicily as her wedding gift. Entering into a volcanic crater, descending down into a cavernous opening, a place of fire was considered a way of entering into the womb of the earth, being reborn and ascending thereafter. The sun was connected to the underworld, especially in Orphic and certain Pythagorean accounts which also speak of a central fire. At the center of the cosmos, there is a fire. We have the image of the stars having been fire pockets beneath the earth and of becoming a star after descending down. We have the rituals of incubation, according to which one spends a long period of time underneath or in isolation and thereby attains a certain mastery, a certain lucidity by immobilizing the body, by immobilizing the mind, by being in this state of isolation and darkness, of incubation, one is then able to become an initiate to become spiritually fulfilled. And that's the tradition that was prevalent here in Sicily and in southern Italy during the times of Empedocles. Descent is connected to ascent. Katabasis to anabasis in the Greek. According to Pindar, one of the ends of the titanic serpent Typhon is underneath Etna. The other one is underneath the volcanic openings in Campania near Naples. And the association of the sun with the serpent is also very common. Remember that Apollo defeats Python, but he often appears in the form of a snake. His oracle takes on the name of the snake, Pythia. One of his greatest priests, who the hagiographies tell us was a partial incarnation of Apollo, Pythagoras, takes on the name of Python again. So the snake is defeated, but integrated. The dragon is defeated, but Siegfried drinks the blood of the dragon. As far as the philosophy of Empedocles, we won't go into it too much, but we have two principles, love and strife, which we could connect to the later Platonic and Neoplatonic apeiron and peras, the unlimit or boundlessness and limit. In terms of movement, these would be analogous to the centrifugal and the centripetal, to that which diffuses and that which concentrates. And where you find a balance between the two, you find stability. That's where an entity can manifest itself. These are obviously also expressible in terms of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And speaking of the divine feminine and masculine, Empedocles is one of the origins in Western thought of the idea of the four elements of air, earth, fire, water. And he presents these in terms of the gods. I follow Peter Kingsley in his reading of Empedocles when he talks about how Zeus is identified with air, actually ether. Air is a subtype of ether from the surface of the earth all the way to the top of the heavens, that's ether. The earth would be Hera, life-giving Hera. Fire is Hades. Persephone is water. And he uses Nestis. Nestis is a local name, a non-Greek indigenous Sicilian name for the goddess of the underworld.
That connection takes us back to Hephaestus. When Virgil later on would write his Aeneid, he refers to Hephaestus as fiery. He identifies him with fire. Empedocles does that too. Hades is also Hephaestus. He uses these terms alternatively to refer to different aspects of fire. So the lord of the underworld who took his wife here at Etna is an aspect of the god who has his cyclopses here and who's able to forge weapons in this place. Now there's all kinds of stories around Empedocles, including his healing of a whole town by diverging a river and purifying its waters because it was being afflicted by the plague. That story relates to Hercules. Hercules would have been the hero that the religiosity of this area hearkened to. Empedocles does at one point tell his student that he will be able to heal the sick to change the weather even to descend into Hades and fetch a soul of a dead man and bring it back to the land of the living. And the expression he uses, as you will, or according to your wish, is a quote from Homer. But in the epics, Homer only uses those words in relation to the gods. Empedocles seems to be telling his disciple that he will be able to do that which is associated with the power of of the gods. What Empedocles is doing to the Homeric corpus is bringing out its esoteric meaning, using it to empower the spiritual seeker. In a sense, this is what the gospel is doing to the Old Testament when it refers to the disciples performing miracles. These and greater things you will do if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Those sorts of statements can be read very much as consistent with Empedocles. Interestingly, the work of Empedocles will surface again centuries later in the context of Islam. So we have the theology of Aristotle produced in Baghdad, translation of sections of Plotinus' work, but it mentions Empedocles. It describes Empedocles as a giyath, talks about him as having a very high spiritual status. The term giyath, meaning helper, might mean that he was considered a prophet. Since Islam teaches that to every nation prophets have been sent, Empedocles would have been one of those who came before Muhammad and Christ. We have also the Mushaf al-Jama'a, a work from the 9th or 10th century, partially translated to Latin as the Turba Philosophorum, and it depicts a round table of philosophers presided over by Pythagoras. Empedocles is among them, and at one point he explains the centrality of the sun and the connection of the sun to the depths. It's not just a place of high, but also of deep radiance. You can think of the sun above as having undergone its nightly underworldly journey, just as the soul has to undergo an inward journey in order to shine. To shine outwardly is to center oneself inwardly. We can interpret the association in these terms. Later on in the 12th century, in the circle of Shurawardi, a great Persian sage, Empedocles again seems to be discussed as having a high spiritual status. Sometimes he's presented as the first of the five great Greek sages, ending with Plato and Aristotle, and as having studied with King David and King Solomon. In the other side of the Muslim world, you have Empedoclean mysticism in the figure of Muhammad ibn Masara, or at least that's what certain scholars scholars contend. Ibn Masara would have been a muladi, which is to say an indigenous Iberian, a local Hispano-Roman who was a Muslim. His father would likely have converted. His work, being mystical and of a certain bent, was looked at with suspicion by the ruling authorities down in the south of Spain in Cordoba, the Arabic dynasty, and eventually they were seized and burnt. But we have long passages in other writers commenting on him, so they've been preserved by proxy. At some point, Ibn Masara makes his pilgrimage to the east, and perhaps during that period, he encounters the philosophy of Empedocles. He might even have made a stop here in Sicily. A follower of his, also an indigenous Hispano-Roman, Ibn al-Husayn Ibn Qasi, lived in the south of what's now Portugal, and he organized his followers, Masarian, or we could say Empedoclean Sufis, into an order called the Muridun, the Disciples, and they waged guerrilla warfare against the Muslim authorities, allying with Christians. And in fact, Ibn Qasi eventually carved out a state 
and gave up his state to the northern Christian king. So he was willing to ally with and even extend the political domain of Christians, even though he himself was a Muslim, a Sufi Muslim. We fast forward to the last of the heroes of this mountain, more recent myth and lore that Etna has accrued around herself. We're still in the Middle Ages, and we have a Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick II, Hohenstaufen, grandson of Frederick Barbarossa, who's also king of Sicily. He's a very interesting figure. There were all sorts of legends circulating at the time, including some attributed to Merlin, according to which King Arthur would return. Godfrey of Viterbo identifies these legends with Frederick II. And some of these ideas of a restoring emperor in whom sacred authority and Roman emperorship are united can be traced back to Pseudo-Methodius and the Tribertine Sibyl and others. But Frederick II fulfilled one particular aspect of the prophetic imagination of the time in that he took Jerusalem and he took it peacefully. He fell afoul of the popes and was in constant conflict with them. His son Manfred died at the hands of Charles of Anjou and then Charles II. They were favored by the popes, but Frederick and his career would continue to spark the imaginations of people in the Antichrist. Nietzsche considered Frederick the first good European according to his taste, as he puts it, the first good European to my taste. Now, Sicilian verse flowered in Frederick's court, as did legal thought. We have the Constitution of Melfi, which is studied to this day. He opened a university in which Roman law was studied in Naples. In many ways, he anticipates modernity. And he had his capital, his court, his harem in Palermo. But over here, in eastern Sicily, we have a connection again to Etna. There is an account according to which a Franciscan monk had a vision of Frederick II riding after his death with his men into Etna, where he sleeps still. This is very common. There's a lot of stories of great kings who sleep in mountains and who will return. So it's a perennial theme. It connects us to the excommunication of Frederick. Dante in the Divine Comedy is willing to go along with that, and he does put Frederick II in hell. But Manfred, his son, Frederick's son, he puts in purgatory and says that after a period of purging, he will enter paradise, which contradicted the church because the Pope had excommunicated Manfred as well. Dante was willing to strike out against clerical authority in that respect. The hellish station of Frederick II, because of its connection with Etna, we may then cast in the light of those Orphic and Pythagorean and specifically Southern Italian traditions according to which one encounters a celestial elevation by way of an entry to the underworld. Aeneas saw the Elysian heavenly Rome by entering the volcanic caverns near Naples. Your descent is an ascent. When Plato takes us through the idea that we are actually not on the surface of the earth, but locked in a chamber, ample, but still subterranean, and that the apparent descent into the underworld is actually an ascent into the surface and into the light of the sun, which we have not hitherto been able to perceive, and it's the central image of Plato's Republic, What he's doing is he's giving us the meaning of this schema that is so prominent in Empedocles and in the mythology of southern Italy and Sicily, at least of its Orphic and Pythagorean schools. There you go. Etna and her heroes. I hope that was enjoyable. It's not the usual content I upload to this channel, but I thought the topic deserved it. I will also be uploading another video in which I read out some of the most relevant quotes that I could find from works that I reference in this video, and a few others. And yeah, just to close, I recommend people visit this place, especially if one feels connected to its myths and figures, if one understands oneself as somehow in the wake of those figures. It's a great place to visit on a sort of pilgrimage, to feel the black volcanic sand, to contemplate the associations. And Etna is still active, so it's worth seeing. 
Obviously, Sicily is great. The people, the history, the sights, the food. All right, signing off.